right, I think we're good to get started. Um, some people may still trickle in, um, but we don't wanna hold anyone up any further. So let me begin by welcoming you all to the latest installment of Lead Her series. Today, we're gonna learn about improving our health and wellness through the power of plants. First off, a special welcome to our leaders here today, our Women United Chair, Julia Johnson, which I'm not sure is on the call, but still welcome to her as she does join. And our Vice Chair, Rachel George, which I know is on the call, and our manager, Lauren Pereira. Thank you, ladies, for all that you do for Women United. And the wonderful group of ladies um, that, bring your, that bring you today's session. Uh, first, our engagement committee member, Chair Jan Turner, and our Vice Chair, Erica Dean, which I know she was not able to attend last minute. Um, and our Health and Wellness Committee members, Rachel George, Sandy Perillo Simmons, and myself. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, so before we jump right into our main events, uh, calling all volunteers. So we do, have, the Women United does have a volunteer opportunity uh, for our spring of year caring that's currently underway and it goes through June. The event offers both virtual and in-person opportunities. Uh, the projects are gonna focus on children and youth success, financial security for families and providing basic necessities such as food and shelter. Um, I know that we have a link in the presentation. I'm not sure that we can click on it, but if not, we can definitely send that out after the event. Yeah, we can also probably put it in the chat as well. Oh, great. Yes, thank you, Sandy. Thank you for that. Awesome, yeah. All right, so without further ado, uh, I wanted to welcome you guys here uh, for our guest speaker, Michalina DeCivio. Uh, Michalina is a health and lifestyle network marketing professional, author, educator, and leader of health advocacy team called Let Us Be Good. Um, let, oh, sorry, I'm, I apologize. Let Us Be the Good. Um, her inspirational story was published back in May of 2019 in the number one bestseller, The Art of Unlearning, Personal Stories on the Courage to Step Out of Your Comfort Zone. For 25 years, McLena served in various leadership roles within the IT financing industry, beginning at IBM, before trading in her typical nine to five to pursue her life's passion to help others achieve better health and prosperity. She's currently an active member of her local parish, St. Rose of Lima in Newtown and Walking with Purpose, which is a Bible study for women. She's also co-founder of Vino, virtual networking organization, and the leader of Ivy Life Community where she has spoken and taught on many different topics. She serves as on their personal board of directors and is often called upon to, for advice and counsel. McLena earned her BS in economics from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. She's a graduate from the Institute for Integrative Nutrition and it is board certified by the American Association of Drugless Practitioners. In her spare time, she enjoys cooking. I know that Rachel took a, a cooking class with her uh, recently and it looked like a lot of fun, exercising and reading anything related to personal growth. Um, most of all, she loves spending time with her family and her friends and then deepening her faith. So Michalina, welcome to the group. Thank you so much. Thank you for that kind introduction. And I'm noticing from the cover shot there that that was my pre-COVID hairdo. <laughs> <laughs> I have had a few haircuts, uh, but yeah, as you can tell, it's uh, definitely a pre-COVID shot, but I really appreciate the opportunity to be with all of you today and to share um, and help, help you to hopefully gain some insight and learn some things that I learned from my own personal experience over the years with health uh, challenges and even loss to health concerns. We lost my dad and my family when I was five years old. And so for us, this, um, for me personally, this is a real, um, you know, something that I'm very passionate about is helping other people to avoid some of the challenges that my family faced with um, heart disease in particular. So I'm just trying to get us to the right spot here. So give me one moment because it was set up and now it's misbehaving. So let's see. Test of patience here. I hope this is going to work this time. Let's go, Google. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. There we go. It's just loading. 
All right, let's see if this works this time. It says loading. Of course, you have to love technology. Sometimes it really does. There we go. All right, let's see. I think this time we got it. How's this? You see that slide? Improving health and yep, wellness? Yeah, we got it. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. So of course I tested it two or three times this morning and at showtime it decided to glitch, but here we are. So thank you so much again. Um, as you see here from the subtitle, the, the news isn't that fruits and vegetables are good for you, but it is that they're so good for you, they could save your life. And so um, this afternoon, we're gonna start with just a little bit of bad news, but I promise we'll end on a high note. Um, if I can ask by show of hands, how many of you know someone who's got one of these diseases? heart disease, cancer, diabetes, obesity. I bet every one of us knows somebody who's been affected by any of these um, diseases. And so as you can see here, so prevalent, one in four will die of heart disease, one in two and one in three men will develop cancer, diabetes, obesity. And in the context of what's happening today with COVID, what we know is that these underlying causes put anyone who uh, does contract COVID at a higher risk, right? So um, now more than ever, I think we want to be really aware of what we can do from a preventive approach to help reverse and even prevent some of these things from happening in the first place. And as we see here from Dr. David Katz at Yale, this is a, uh, he's a wonderful doctor and researcher, someone I highly recommend um, and follow. He says, our children are more harmed by poor diet than by exposure to drugs, alcohol, and tobacco combined. So it's really incumbent on us to, to really pay attention to what we're, uh, how we're fueling our body and our minds because it's everything works together. So what are some of the challenges that we're facing? So let's start with the environment. Industrialization has been wonderful, but of course we have some challenges that come along with that, right? So we have pollution in the air, we have water contaminants, pesticides, prescriptions, et cetera. We also really want to pay attention to things like skincare products and hair care products. Really being careful to read the labels because a lot of what's in there, your skin is your biggest organ. So whatever you're putting in your hair, on your skin, et cetera, will be absorbed into your body. So we wanna pay attention to that. And then of course we have the plastics. Um, we're also, another ch very important challenge that we need to be aware of is the quality of our food, right? So food quality is decreasing. More than 50% of what Americans are eating is processed foods. So some of this may be familiar to you, preservatives, flavor enhancers, emulsifiers, et cetera, growth hormones. Oftentimes this will appear in dairy products like milk, GMO. So for anyone who's not familiar, that stands for genetically modified organisms. So again, this is something that um, at least in our country is very present. It can be present in our wheat products and really anything, even soy is another food that is highly genetically modified. And so we wanna be aware and again, read labels. Um, we also have trans fats, artificial colors. In fact, when it comes to artificial colors, we know that in children, some of the dyes can cause behavioral disruption. So again, really important to be aware of what's in our food. And I like to recommend when I get to the slide that we just Think about where you are when you're shopping in the grocery store. You want to try and shop the perimeter of the store as much as possible. Most of the processed foods tend to be in the center of the store. And I'm thinking about like the cereal aisles and the bread aisles and a lot of the things where you're going to find some processed non-whole foods. The whole foods tend to be on the perimeter, around the perimeter of the store. And then of course, another reason, you know, our quality is decreasing is because we have the travel time of food, right? But what it's from the time it's picked, which by the way, is often, it's picked oftentimes when it's not vine ripened. So if you're picking something too early, it's not in its most nutrient dense state. And then it's traveling. So you can see here broccoli, for example, will lose 50 to 80% of its key nutrients um, before you even purchase it. So I just wanna share, this is another challenge that we really wanna think about. This is oxidative stress and oxidation, you may have heard of this in the context of skin and free radicals, but oxidation is, is a normal broad byproduct of living and breathing. 
that happens, that's happening now as we're sitting here. Um, oxidative stress, however, occurs when there's an imbalance between the free radicals and the antioxidants in your body. And so when you have this imbalance, this instability can lead to DNA damage and other issues in the body, which is why it's so important, again, to think about, you know, what are the ways we can um, enhance the, uh, the amount of antioxidants through our food that we're consuming. But you can see some of the causes here we covered on the environment chart of pollutions and medications, for example, right? Fast food, stress, of course. <laughs> um, we've all been under quite a lot of stress in the last year. Alcohol and pesticides, exposures to toxins. We're going to focus on foods in particular in this talk, fruits and vegetables, but even excessive exercise can cause oxidative stress. Yeah, it happens. That's what, so every, just about, as you see at the bottom of the chart here, just about everything we do results in oxidation or inflammation. And actually I'm seeing some of your reactions to the exercise. So this is why many times when uh, we see athletes, for example, at the end of a season, they get sick. Or I know a number of people who are marathon runners. When the marathon is over, they get sick. They get a really bad, because their, their body's like, whoa, that was a lot, you know? Um, so this is something we really wanna be aware of. Inflammation can oftentimes be what we call silent inflammation. This is actually what I personally experienced 11 years ago. I was diagnosed with something called osteopenia, which is the precursor to osteoporosis, which is the loss of bone density. That is what we call a form of silent inflammation. I had no idea it was going on because I didn't feel it until I broke my leg. I had a stress fracture and that was a pivotal moment that really set me on this course of paying more attention to my own, to my own health. So just uh, something to be aware of. So where has this all led us, right? What are the consequences of not paying attention to some of these factors? So what I'm going to do now is share with you just a, a really powerful trailer of a documentary called Forks Over Knives. Um, the companion book to this trailer would be, it's called The China Study. So if you're interested in learning more about this, you can grab the book, but I'm just going to share this clip with you and then we'll uh, continue on the back end. This could be the first generation of children in the United States that lives less than its parents. Pills I take for my diabetes, then I got one for cholesterol, high blood pressure, and then I take Bieta, which is an injectable. I'm getting really shaky and I'm sick and I'm fatigued, and that's when they diagnosed me with hypertension and diabetes. Obesity, diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure cost this country more than $120 billion each year. People are saying, you're crazy. You're a cancer patient. You should be resting. Doctors told me this. When I had the second heart attack, the doctor said, I should prepare for death. Heart disease is an absolutely toothless paper tiger that need never, ever exist. People who were raised in Japan, the Philippines, Korea, China, never had heart disease, prostate cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis. This is the atlas of cancer mortality in China. Virtually the Western diet was non-existent. They had no animal products. They had no dairy, no meat. We learned that we could turn on and turn off cancer growth just by adjusting the level of intake of that protein. I knew at that point what caused most diseases. Our national authorities are simply excluding this concept in order to protect the status quo. The Western diet, there are going to be half a million people in this country this year who will have to have the front half of their body divided, their heart exposed. Some people would call that extreme. I know of nothing else in medicine that can come close to what a plant-based diet can do. You go through life thinking that what happens to you from a health perspective is based on your genes. You're a helpless victim. I reverse the diabetes. The diabetes is not coming back. I just can't understand what it's done to change my life. Diet is so much more important than anybody ever thought. To me, the answer is so simple, it's criminal. It's just people starting to take responsibility for their health and starting to eat more plant-based foods. It's that simple. All right. I love that because the answer is so simple that it's criminal. And I, I, one other point that I really want to drive home here is that um, for any of us that may have some family history of certain diseases, et cetera, 
Just remember that line about you are not necessarily a victim of your genes. Um, certainly it plays a role, no doubt, but there's this whole area of study called epigenetics. And it's important to know that your food and your lifestyle choices, what you're thinking is so powerful. Food turns, can turn genes on and off. So um, again, just another reason to really pay attention to how we're fueling our body. So as I mentioned a moment ago, in terms of antioxidants and oxidative stress, of course, the bad news is that having too few of the healthy foods like the fruits and vegetables are going to cause this you know, excess and oxidative stress, which does cause aging and disease. The good news is, however, that nature has given us some very powerful resources, right? And so as they said in the film here, it's up to us to take responsibility for our own health and really, again, just try to incorporate more of the colorful foods to help protect ourselves from the oxidative stress and from that imbalance. So at a high level, what can we do to be healthier? And I love this slide because it focuses on what I consider to be the six key pillars of health. And I know that in the other presentations that you've had in the series, you've talked about exercise, so we won't spend a lot of time on it here, but it's really important to move your body at least three to five days a week. If you can get 30 minutes in at a clip at a minimum, that's terrific. Getting proper sleep, right? So this is an average seven to eight hours of sleep a night, but you know your body best. The idea here is to help our bodies prepare for sleep. So to the extent you can turn off your electronic devices at least an hour beforehand. I recommend no food or drink within three hours of going horizontal, right? To help your body rest and digest. And keeping your room slightly cool, your room dark, you've probably heard some of these before, but it is good, a good reminder. Sleep is so important. There's a lot of repair and detoxification that happens when you're sleeping. And so it's really, please don't underestimate the power of a good night's sleep. And by the way, there is no such thing as catching up on sleep. Okay, so it may make us feel better, but in terms of your uh, health and what's happening with your hormonal situation when you're sleeping, it's really important to get a solid night's sleep. Of course, managing stress is so important. In the last year, I'm sure has tested us more than we would have wanted to be tested. So stress is, again, really important to pay attention to this. So um, you can practice things like mindfulness and meditation. My personal favorite is prayer. So I start my day this way, just being quiet. Whatever form works for you is great. There are some wonderful apps out there to help you get started. Apps like Calm and Headspace. There are also some great books and resources out there you can take a look at. There's a great method called EFT, Emotional Freedom Technique, or otherwise known as tapping, which is another great way to manage stress. I highly recommend looking into that. It's a form of acupressure, not acupuncture, but acupressure. Uh, drinking plenty of water, staying hydrated. So a good guideline here is half your body weight in ounces of water. So the math is really simple. If you're 100 pounds, you want to drink at least 50 ounces of water. If you're active, then you need more. Using hey, Lena, Nick, just a quick question. What did the EFT stand for? Emotional? It's emotional freedom technique. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Otherwise known as tapping. And two of the people actually who are very great teachers of this modality started out right here in Sandy Hook, Connecticut, where I live, um, Nick and Jessica Ortner, and they have a wonderful app. So there's some ability there to do a trial if you decide you want to look into that further. And then, of course, there's a subscription that you can look into as well. Does that answer your question? Rachel, you good? Yes. Okay. Drinking plenty of water, so as we said, half your body weight. Safer, uh, using safer products. Um, again, paying attention, especially now with COVID and what's happening, we're all busy cleaning our homes and everything. Try to use, if you're gonna use something with a chemical in it, like a bleach or something like that, be sure you have your windows open, you have good ventilation you know, in your home. Um, and of course, eating real food, right? So this is where we're gonna spend a little more time today really focusing on this because again, food is information to your DNA. So we really want to be aware of what we're putting into our bodies. And here, you know, in my studies in nutrition, the one thing I can tell you, friends from every dietary theory in the world, the one thing that all scientists agree upon is that fruits and vegetables are critical. 
they're healing, they're alkaline, they're really important. They agree, as you see here, most diseases are preventable with good nutrition. In fact, David Katz gave a talk several years ago that I attended when he came here actually to Newtown. And he taught us that 75%, up to 75% of all chronic illnesses, like obesity, like diabetes, like heart disease, can be prevented or reversed with diet and lifestyle changes. Really powerful stuff. MD Anderson Cancer Hospital put this wonderful graphic together and I wanted to share it with you because I think it's a great summary of why eating plants is so important. So we know that it helps to optimize the function of the immune system. And by the way, I use this word boost very, very carefully these days because what can happen is, you know, um, the word boost, do pay attention to it because what you don't want to do is have an overactive immune system. So again, in the context of what's happening with COVID, you may have heard this term, the cytokine storms that can happen. And this is when your immune system goes into an overactive state and can actually work against you. So you want to be really careful about optimizing your immune system, not necessarily putting it in overdrive, okay, because that can actually work against you. But reducing inflammation, we know plants are very good for that. And there's lots of research on all of this stuff. Maintaining a healthy weight. Plants are full, filled with fiber, so fiber is so good for us. And then all of these things put together will help to lower our risk of cancer. This I thought was so important to share, especially again in the context of what's happening today with regard to the immune system, right? This is something we all wanna pay really close attention to. Plants have essential nutrients that you cannot get from any other food. The vitamins and the minerals, the phytochemicals and the antioxidants, which by the way, we don't typically see in a multivitamin, and we're gonna talk about those in a minute, uh, but the phytochemicals and the antioxidants in plants help to keep your cells healthy and your body in balance so that your immune system can function its best. And I love this quote by Andrea Murray. She's a MD Anderson health education specialist. Plants give your body what it needs to help fight off infection. And a plant-based diet strengthens your immune system to protect you against germs and microorganisms. Would anybody like a little bit more of that? Yes? Especially <laughs> during COVID. Okay. I'm sorry? Especially during COVID and a pandemic. Yes, especially, especially. If this doesn't wake us up, my friends, what we're going through right now, I honestly don't know what it will take for us to pay more attention to our health and more attention to helping the younger or the next generation to be healthier. This is so, so, so important to reconnect with um, our bodies, with what they were created to consume. And this is where for me personally, I have that spiritual connection to my work because this is what we were created again to consume. Then we have the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, plant-based diets. This is so powerful. Reduce heart disease risk by 40%. This is just from the diet, just from the food. So can you imagine the impact, right? Even greater when you're combining the food with the mindfulness, the healthy mind practices, the lifestyle practices, again, surrounding yourself with happy, positive, uplifting people, right? That makes a big difference, a very, very big difference. In terms of diseases, disease loves to thrive, will thrive in an acid forming environment, in an acidic environment. So I wanted to share with you this acid versus alkaline chart because this is really, it helps you get a visual of the kinds of foods that you want to spend more time you know, consuming. So what you're gonna notice generally speaking is the foods on the left are less colorful. There's a little less variety there. The foods on the right are going to be your fruits, your vegetables, your, you know, your plant-based um, foods. So acidic environment, disease loves to thrive here. So things like cancers and viruses, et cetera, they love all that sugary stuff, right? That helps them to grow. Alkalinity is so much better for us, right? So we want to eat and consume as much of those colorful fruits and vegetables as we, as we can get our hands on. Um, I, will, I will say, and perhaps this surprises some of you too, to see the wine 
<laughs> over on the left hand side, right? Because we have heard um, that wine, for example, does have uh, some very, it does have some healthy properties. The resveratrol is in there and that's good for our hearts. Um, however, you know, I think the, the fact that it's in here is more about the sugar and the alcoholic content. And by the way, there are so many other wonderful ways to get the benefits of the polyphenols, et cetera, that are in something like wine. But again, everything in moderation, right? So there's nothing wrong with enjoying, you know, with enjoying a glass of wine um, here and there. I have a quick question. Absolutely. I love popcorn. <laughs> I <suck>. so yeah. <laughs> Hello. Does it make a difference if you make your popcorn from scratch? So, you know, traditional on the stove, popcorn kernels and olive oil or what have you versus buying processed popcorn? Right. So yes, I would say yes. So if you're, if you're doing popcorn, corn is another one of those foods, Stephanie, that is highly genetically modified. So you do want to make mm. sure that you're always buying non-GM, non-GMO organic, um, you know, okay. organic corn. Sure. And then anytime you're making something at home, it's great because you know exactly what's in it. Right. right. So you can use a healthier oil like olive oil versus, um, you know, sunflower or safflower oil or something like that, which right. can go rancid. I don't know if you're familiar with, with that. And that's oftentimes why you see those oils, safflower oil, for example, or something like that will be sold in a dark colored bottle because when it's exposed to light, it can actually get mm -hmm. rancid. So olive oil is, is, a, is a great option. Avocado oil is another great option. Coconut right? oil works, coconut tastes oil. lovely too. So yes. yes. Okay, love, great. Yeah. In fact, we use the coconut oil in the recipe that Rachel, we made last week with the group. So great question. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. So in terms of diseases and toxins, and it's so important to understand the role of fat cells because I know we don't like fat generally on our bodies, but they really do serve a really important purpose. But here is, this is an important concept to understand because the fat cells surround the toxins to prevent them from harming our vital organs. So what you see here are two examples of, you know, two ways that you can try to shed some weight. So in the top section, you see what our typical dieting or over-exercising plan looks like, right? We have some extra pounds we're, we're, we're carrying. Um, we, we try to burn the fat, right? Perhaps we're over-exercising or um, and sometimes starving ourselves, you know, maybe not necessarily getting enough of the right foods, namely plants, right? So what can happen is you're burning the fat, but you're not detoxing. You're not the, the toxins are still residing in your body. You're not actually shuttling them out. So what happens is they're still there and we rebound, right? This has happened to many of us where we go on a diet and then, you know, whatever, a few weeks or a month later, the weight comes right back. The healthier way to do this is to understand that when you flood your body with the plants, plants play a critical role in detoxifying. They help take the toxins out. They literally are like a little magnet and they help to pull it out. So when you're doing the exercise with the right dietary, you know, uh, guidelines, and so what you see here is a reference to a program that um, actually I'm in the middle of right now and, and Rachel's doing this with me, um, where we're incorporating a lot of plant nutrition into our diets. What happens is we're helping to take the toxins out. And so then of course, we're going to the fat, the fat is going to naturally decrease, right? You get this better overall health, less fat, more muscle, no rebound. And it truly is not about being skinny. It's about being healthy. We're all made differently. We have different frames. So this is, you do not compare yourself to anybody else. You just, you know, you have to see and do what's right, what's right for your own, you know, your own body. So how many fruits and vegetables do we really need to eat every single day? And this is where it gets really tricky. So we do need seven to 13 servings of fruits and veggies every day. And if you're an athlete or someone who's active, you need to eat even more. And by the way, we need variety. So this is a very key concept I learned in nutrition school that, you know, it's great if you're eating any fruits and vegetables, let's just say that to begin with, but it's really important to make sure you're getting variety because different foods have different combinations of phytonutrients and they all have such amazing benefits. So why so many? Well, things have changed over the years for sure. So as I mentioned earlier, we have produce being picked way before 
it's fully developed on the vine. So for example, these green bananas, right? Truly, they're not very nutrient dense. They've been picked too early. So what happens when they sit in the grocery store is they start to rot. They taste good because, you know, that's the sugar thing is happening in there, but it's not, they're not really more nutritious. We have the transportation of food. And as you see here at the bottom of the chart, many of us just aren't getting enough. Our lifestyles are so busy and we're not getting enough variety. So we need to make sure we're paying attention to this. So what do most people do? Most Americans, when they feel like they have a gap in their diets, we run out and we go get something like a multivitamin, right? So it says here, 70% of Americans will try to fill their gaps with a multivitamin. And so here, I just want to give you a little bit of insight into the difference between a multivitamin and a whole food, and also just a little bit on the labeling, because it's really important to understand the labeling. So um, what you'll see here on the left is a typical multivitamin label. It will say supplement facts. And what you'll see here is the FDA's requirement whenever you have a supplement facts label is that each individual ingredient that has been either manually, you know, it's been manufactured or pulled from nature or somehow it's pushed into this capsule. And so they have to itemize, if you will, in accounting terms, you know, every little thing that's in that supplement. This is how you know you're getting something that's not a whole food source, okay? Food, on the other hand, is going to have, and I'm gonna hold up here, hopefully you can see me, a bag of, is this showing up on camera? Here we go, a bag of almonds, I'm gonna try to get a little closer. And what you can see here is it's a nutrition facts label, okay? So that means this is food. And what you're gonna notice from a nutrition facts label is it looks very different. It only has a couple of things like total fat, it says cholesterol, sodium, total carbs and fiber, right? The reason the FDA has a different label for food than it does for a supplement is because food like this apple over here on the right side of this chart has thousands of phytonutrients and other, um, I mean, I use the word chemicals, but natural, you know, chemicals to the food. You can't possibly have all those on a label, right? So they created a separate label called a nutrient, a nutrition facts label, and it has just those key components. So just because you don't see as much line items on a nutrition facts label doesn't mean it's less healthy. Okay, there's a, there's a reason it looks different. So I share that because I know sometimes when people are shopping for products, you go to like a big box store and you're looking at different things. You might look at this label on the left here and go, wow, that looks really good. Look at that. It's got like 25 different things. That must be really good. And then you look at this product and you're like, oh, it doesn't show like too many things. Oh, this must not be so good. Totally not true. All right, it's the difference, the requirement and the labeling because one is food and this other thing is not necessarily uh, the whole food. So just a little, again, just wanna make sure that we, ha we have a good understanding for the differences because it's really important in the marketplace. Vitamins, multivitamins has a few generally isolated nutrients. As I said, the phytonutrients in this one food, one apple has about 10,000 that work synergistically inside the body. And you have to be real careful with multivitamins, my friends. Please make sure that if you have a doctor or someone who's telling you to take a vitamin, that they have been trained in nutrition. Many good doctors will tell you that they only get about two of nutrition education. I'm getting a lot of background noise. Somebody, is that? Neelam, Neelam, can you hear us? Can you mute? Great. I think I just muted her. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, excellent. So research shows that isolated vitamins can do more harm than good. So again, just be really careful and work with someone in the nutrition field that you trust that can guide you um, the way you need to be guided. All right, this is really exciting. Here's another way, another fun way you can incorporate more plants into your lifestyle. You can grow your own food, right? So these are, this is a concept called vertical tower gardening. Actually, you can see mine here behind me in my office. I'm growing a variety of lettuces and kale and cilantro. I grow year round. I have um, the tower garden flex unit, which is over here on the right. 
And we love this because this is an easy way to help families take control of their food safety and food quality. You can, it's great on the environment because you're using a lot less water, 98% less water, 90% less space. You're getting a higher yield, fewer insects to deal with and all this three times faster in a safe, nutritious environment. And I just wanna show you, for example, how easy this is. I have, this is just a little, what we call a net pot. Okay, so your little seedling will grow in one of these. I like to grow in these, what we call cocoa cores. This is made of coconut husk. It's not dirt, although I know it looks like dirt. You just pop it right in here. And this pops into a port of the tower. You don't have to be, you know, you don't have to have a green thumb to do this. Anyone can grow their own food. I planted these little lettuces from seed two weeks ago. You see how big they are already. So as we start consuming this lettuce, I pop one of these in and we just continue growing around the clock. So it's a lot of fun. I highly encourage uh, gardening, you know, start growing your own food. So may, may, may I ask a quick question, Rachel, again, I'm sorry. So yeah. you just buy the seeds from the packets like we see in all the stores? Yes, exactly. Well, I mean, I don't, yes, I buy them from sources. Yes, from a source that I trust where it's a, it's a non-genetically modified seed. You know, I use a company called High Mowing. Um, and then I order the little coconut pods from uh, off of Amazon. And I just plant my own. If you don't want to, you know, if you were going to garden this way, or even if you're going to garden outside in the dirt, you can buy the seedlings, you know, they'll be shipped to you and then you can just put them in. So they're about you know, it's a lot less expensive to do it this way. You know, if I were to go to a, a tower farmer and buy one of these, it would be $2. But, you know, doing it this way, it's like 60 cents to grow. And this will become a huge, big head of romaine lettuce in about maybe five to six weeks. Thank you. Okay, yes, good question. Here are some wonderful resources to help you get started. Lots of great stuff here, healthylivingrevolution.com. You're going to see some wonderful cookbooks. And again, last week when I had the cooking session, we pulled from these books. We made a delicious uh, chicken and uh, vegetable dish with peanut sauce, it was great. And then we made this wonderful um, chocolate pudding with avocado, right? It was so good. You wouldn't even know that avocado was in there. It's absolutely delicious. And avocado is such a healthy fat that it keeps you full. And so it's just really satiating, so healthy, so good for your skin and just a wonderful, wonderful plant food. So you'll get lots of ideas in those cookbooks. Um, and then you'll see some other book recommendations here on the bottom of the slide. I love them all. I would say the Blue Zones, Brain Maker, I mean, they're all great. And then China Study I mentioned earlier, it's a complement to the Forks Over Knives film, which I highly recommend that um, you, know, consider, you consider watching. This is a challenge that I run with some friends about, uh, well, once a month for 10 days, we, we run this program. So if anyone is interested or would like some help in getting started on a more of a plant-based lifestyle and you um, want to join our group, we're going to be doing this again next month in May. We'll start on May 10th, which is the day after Mother's Day. But we're in the middle of one of these challenges right now. And I'm, I'm so happy that, you know, Rachel is joining me for this 10 day run. This is what we're practicing. And so if you're someone who's very new to, you know, cleaner eating or healthier eating, I would say don't try all of this at once because it can be really overwhelming. But perhaps you take one of the items and you practice that, eliminating gluten or dairy, for example. We know from just science and experience that many people are sensitive to these foods. They may not necessarily know it. Doesn't mean you have to have, you know, uh, Crohn's or some serious thing. You might just be sensitive to gluten and perhaps you feel better and less bloated when you're not consuming it. Everybody's different. So you're gonna see what works best for you. But we practice reducing some of the things that we know. These are also, uh, gluten and dairy can cause inflammation in the body as can you know, alcohol, sugar, reducing caffeine is very helpful to many people. And then we add a lot more of these plant-based, really delicious, satisfying meals, drinking plenty of water and practicing the things that I mentioned in the six pillars early on. And of course, exercising most days. And finally, here's my contact information. If anyone would like to just talk more one-on-one -on -one and uh, you know, explore some of these ideas further, or you're looking for support, or perhaps you have questions about your own you know, situation, I'm happy to offer any guidance. And again, 
if I'm not the right person to help you, I'm sure I know somebody who can. So I'm happy to be a resource to any of you and also get to know you and what you're doing. And maybe I can help you with your, you know, whatever your life goals are. Um, so I very, again, feel very honored to be a part of this uh, series and grateful for your time. And I'm going to stop the share now. And I'm happy to, uh, so it's 1245. Okay, so pretty good timing, right? So if anyone has, um, can I, is it okay to open the lines for questions? Okay. Yeah, there is, um, Mick, there's a, there is one question in the chat. Okay. Um, and it, it, the question's from Melissa O'Hara and it's, um, is seltzer, uh, oop, I, I just lost it. Is seltzer part of the carbonated drink? Yeah, so that's interesting. Yeah. So seltzer, yeah. So seltzer, um, I have learned is slightly, you know, is slightly acidic. Um, so again, but you know, here's the thing with any of these things, it's, I try to encourage people to follow what I call an 80 20 rule, right? So you 80% of the time, if you can try to stay on track and make those really good choices, you're doing great you know, 20% of the time, because we have to live life and enjoy life, right? So, um, you know, if that's, for example, something that you really enjoy, but you know, the rest of your day is really healthy, and you're eating well and doing all, you know, that's okay, I would say that's okay. But perhaps you might consider over time, maybe trying something like a flavored water or some other thing, you know, um, again, what with any of these changes, I just encourage, because you wanna be successful over the long haul. So we don't wanna make dramatic changes overnight that won't feel good to you and won't stick. This is a, it's a long, this is a long game, right? It's like investing in the stock market, right? You want, you're in it for the long haul. Julia, thanks for the smile. I appreciate it. <laughs> hey Mick, I actually have oh, another question. Yes. Um, when you offer the challenge to eliminate cal uh, dairy, how, like, what are some good food sources to get that calcium that we need for strong bones? Right. Yeah. So that's a great question. So there are some, um, so for example, broccoli, et cetera, will have calcium in it, but you have to eat a lot of broccoli, right. To get, to get the calcium. So there are some other sort like, um, yogurts, for example, is another great, you know, great source. And now there are some non-dairy yogurts like almond, they're used with almond milk or coconut milk where you can get calcium. Um, and, but I will say, so calcium is one for me and I don't know about each of your, you know, health pictures, right? Everybody is different, but for me personally, especially because of my history with the osteopenia, I do take an, uh, an additional calcium supplement but I, I've chosen one that comes from, it's made with algae. The source is algae. So it's a plant sourced uh, calcium as opposed to, you know, one of the generic more uh, common kinds that you see on the market. Um, but yeah. in terms of getting it from your, again, from your plate, there are some great alternatives that you can, you know, we can talk more about brands and all that kind of stuff if you want Sandy offline, but there are some great, great ones. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, no, that's good. No, I was just gonna ask the same question as a woman, right? We have to have our milk and dairy. Um, <laughs> and so I was hoping, right, trying to get the same answer um, from that one as well. So thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, you're welcome. I mean, we do eat a lot of broccoli here. That's a great one. And then I do also have other things that I do to fill, you know, to fill the gaps in our diets here at home. Melissa, do I see a raised hand? Yep. Um, so actually the, the tower that you presented is really intriguing for me. I Googled it and it's quite an investment to start out on it. Um, and then as you started explaining more about it with the coconut husks and the seeds and stuff, I started getting more afraid. So what, what's like a, a starter way in to do like at home growing something other than herbs, because I, I'd be looking for more food plant products as opposed to just basil or parsley. I, I'm, I can cover that. Um, right. Where would you start? Like where, what, what's the 101 version of right. power? Yeah. So, so that's great. And I'm so glad that you shared that Melissa, because um, I know that it looks like a sort of overwhelming, you know, contraption, but it's actually very simple. Everything is on a timer. So the lights and the watering all happen automatically. 
um, on a timer. I've actually pulled the lights and off and turned the timer off so it wouldn't be noisy while we're on the Zoom call, but it's really pretty self-sufficient. You don't have to do anything other than pop the plants, you know, into the ports as I showed you with these little baskets, and then you put the nutrients in the tank. That's really it. I mean, that is, I have to say, it is the easiest way that we have found to garden because I don't have to worry about the weeding. You know, if you have, the first year we had a tower garden here at home, my daughter and I had a contest. You know, I was growing out on the patio and she had a little piece of our yard where she was trying to grow stuff, you know, and within two weeks, she was all full of weeds down there. And I was like, oh, my lettuce is growing so great. So, you know, it's, um, it is a very simple system that uses what we call aeroponic technology. So um, yes, it's an investment. It's about two or $3 a day, depending on how you, you know, which combination of the unit you want to have. But that's kind of the investment if you break it down. Um, otherwise, if you want to go with traditional, you know, dirt gardening, you can easily just you know, get your little seeds. You can start them indoors in these little pods or even in regular dirt if you want. Just be aware you're probably gonna have a little more challenge with the insects and that kind of thing. Um, and then you can pop these in the ground if you wanna go with regular dirt gardening. Is that helpful? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Sure. What else ladies? Julia, did you have your hand up? So thank you. Um, I felt so exposed from your presentation. I am definitely the person who like bulks up on vitamins, right? Like I, I like my biotin, vitamin D, I buy them all. So your presentation really revealed me uh, some weaknesses in, in my own nutrition that I probably need to eat more fruits and vegetables as opposed to popping them all, you know, right before I go to work or even to work out. So yeah, well, more yeah thank you for sharing that. Um, it's really important, you know, and if, again, if you want, we can talk one-to-one -one and I can share with you more, a little bit about what I'm doing personally in my family, et cetera. But it is really important to look at why you're going for a vitamin. And again, that one chart I think is so powerful because what happens is the whole vitamin industry, right? Why is there a vitamin industry? Because people, when, they, when they're missing something in their diet, they think that if they go for a vitamin, that's gonna fill the gap, right? But the truth is it doesn't because it's not the same as whole food. You're missing out on all those other phytonutrients that are an important part you know, of the food. And so um, it's, it's like micronutrition is what we call mm. it. All of those phytochemicals and resveratrol and all those other things that you wouldn't you know, necessarily get in a, in a vitamin. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the feedback. I if I'd like to follow up on that, Mick, in that um, you know when I started this ten day shred with you guys and you sent out the grocery list, I looked at the list and it looked kind of long. But then I realized, you know, what, I, I it's easy to buy this stuff. I'm just out of the habit. So right. then I went in and bought all of it, and it was no different than if I bought stuff that was less healthy. I still had to be at the grocery store. I still had to pick it off the shelf. So when I got home, I said to myself, you know, why, why didn't I just naturally do this all along? It really was no inconvenience. It looked overwhelming in a list, but it really wasn't. And so I realized for myself that I had gotten into bad habits that were not saving me time. It was just what I was used to doing. So um, I know how we look at these things and say, oh my God, now I got to buy all this stuff. Well, I just replaced things and made sure I had enough. Like I would buy an avocado. Well, this time I bought four. Right. So I just, because of your list, I was prompted to do things a little bit better, but it really was no more energy than if I, the way I used to shop. So it's funny how we think it's overwhelming and I did, but it wasn't. Right. Well, I love how, thank you for sharing that, Rachel, because it is true. I mean, first of all, I think that many of those things on the list might be some staples that people you know, have in their homes anyway, you know, that are on there, but there are so many wonderful substitutes. So I'll just share one fun thing that we started doing, making our own almond milk, less expensive than buying it in the store. And now I know exactly what's in my almond milk. Would you like to know? Almonds? Water. <laughs> Water. <laughs> okay. A touch of salt, Himalayan sea salt, and a splash of, um, 100% maple syrup. 
That's it. Four things. And if you don't want to, you don't have to add the salt and the maple syrup, but I like the combination of the flavors, right? So there's this wonderful new appliance. It's become my, fa I have two favorite things in my kitchen. The Ninja Foodie uh, Grill, the Smart Grill. Has anyone seen that? If you haven't, mm -hmm. it grills, it, I know the word fry is like, sounds bad, but it's air frying. So it's not really frying. It's kind of like just really heating foods up and just a touch of a spray of like avocado oil or something really do a great job with your food. Um, but next to that, the almond cow, which is a fun thing to have that makes delicious almond milk. And you're, you know, again, you're taking a little more control over the quality. Almonds, you have to be really careful with because if they're not organic and grown in a certain way, it tends to be one of the foods where they're sprayed and there's a lot of chemicals that are used in the growing of almonds. So you do want to be careful about those if you're consuming that. Tim, did you have a question or feedback? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, so yeah, this is a great talk. And I would like to know your opinion on those plant-based proteins that are really popular in the grocery stores now, like Beyond Burgers and all those things in the freezer and the plant-based hot dogs and all that kind of stuff. Just tell me your opinion on that. <laughs> yeah, so um, so that's a great question. So I have to say I am partial to the um, to the plant-based protein mix that I recommend for you know customers and clients, et cetera. So I, and the reason is, this is what I, why, what I would say to look for is to make sure that you have something that has a wide variety of plants, whole food plants. Kim, when you're reading the label, you should be able to recognize what is in there. If it's some wackadoodle word you've never seen before, or you can't even pronounce it, probably not a great idea. So I haven't read specifically those labels that you're speaking of, but I'm happy to do it with you one-on-one -on -one if you want. We can go through the labels and I can tell you what I, you know, what I think about it. Um, so I can't speak intelligently about the particular hot dog you're speaking of because I don't, I don't shop for those things. You know, I, gotcha. the, yeah, the kind of foods that I do consume are very simple ingredients. So we'll start with, um, you know, salmon or chicken or some sort of whole food thing and go from there. It's not, complicated to eat healthy. As long as you have just a few key healthy ingredients, you can make some really delicious meals. But call me and we'll talk about the labels that you asked about. Okay. Yeah, thanks. This has been life change. Oh, you can't even see it. Oh, I brought, I got my Forks Over Knives cookbook. Oh, there oh, it is. Awesome. Oh, that's great. Oh, it's like blurring <laughs> out. Anyway, you get the yeah. idea. That's terrific. Good for you. There it is. Good job. <laughs> All right, I think this is my cue to stop, <laughs> all right? Yeah, Michalina, I just wanna say a few closing words. First, thank you so much for sharing all of this. I personally try to eat healthy, but I found so many great tidbits from you um, listening uh, to what you shared today. So thank you so much uh, for joining us. And thank you to all of you who uh, joined us as well. And I just wanted to share a little bit about our upcoming event, the uh, Power of the Purse, right? It's um, Women United's 10th annual Power of the Purse fundraiser and silent auction this year. Um, it'll be presented by Key for Women and it will be held virtually on June 17th, 2021. Um, it's our largest signature fundraiser uh, boasting uh, a quality online auction, an inspiring keynote speaker with Lucinda Cross this year, um, impressive networking opportunities, and a robust sponsor experience. Um, it typically attracts hundreds of local professionals passionate about supporting women and families on the pathway toward uh, financial security. Um, and this year, we will hear from Lucinda Cross, um, and we'll celebrate a decade of work impacting the community. So um, I encourage all of you to get your tickets. Um, Lauren, I believe you'll be able to add a link in the chat. Is that true? Yep, the link is there. Awesome. Thank you, Sandy. Awesome. Yeah, of course. Um, and with that, um, again, thank you guys for uh, joining uh, today. And uh, thanks, Mick, so much for, for sharing your knowledge and insights. My pleasure. It's a lot of fun. Hope to thank see you again so soon. Much. Thank you so <laughs> right. much. Thank you all.